good morning. I hope that uh, over the past week or so, you have had a chance to listen to the all the lectures up to lecture 12 in my course on particle characterization. Um, we should be pretty much done with uh, shape and size characterization by now as far as uh, fundamentals that apply to many uh, mechanical operations. Uh, one thing about size distributions that I do want to reiterate because uh, when, when we talk about mechanical operations in general, the product is typically consists of a, a mixture of particles of various sizes and concentrations. So whether you talk about you know, separation processes like sieving and screening and sedimentation or operations such as size reduction or size enlargement, um, the end product is typically characterized in terms of size distribution. So in addition to knowing how to estimate the size of a single particle, you also have to be able to obtain the size distribution of a population of particles and methods that we discussed in the last class such as scattering based methods enable you to do that in a fairly cost effective and uh, quick turnaround manner. But um, when we talk about particle size distributions, it is important to realize that there are three types of size distributions that are normally talked about. The first is the normal distribution the second is the log normal distribution and the third is the power law distribution. Of the three, it is important to understand which ones are particularly relevant for mechanical operations. So just to recap, a normal distribution is one where you start with a, a set of particles that are mono dispersed. In other words, a set of particles that have pretty much the same size. But then things happen to them which slowly start to broaden the spectrum. So instead of having a single value, you start having a mean value and a distribution around this mean value. And ultimately, once you have a sufficient number of particles analyzed, you will get a normal distribution which has a mean, which has a standard deviation and you know classical laws of statistical analysis can then be applied to understand the variability in the process the uh, process capability limits and so on. Now, unfortunately, normal distributions rarely happen in nature and they definitely do not happen when there is a mechanical operation involved. The most common particle size distribution that you see in nature is the log normal distribution. Um, in a log normal distribution, if you plot logarithm of count, to the log squared of size, you get a straight line, right? Now, what type of processes lead to log normal distributions? Well, it turns out that in a log normal distribution, what you see is that there is a preponderance of fine particles and there is a, a rapid reduction in counts as you go to larger particle sizes, right? Now, why would that happen in nature? In nature it happens because if you recall the trimodal distribution that I sketched in the last class, the, the first particles are nucleated in the environment for example through condensation phenomena that give rise to extremely fine particles that are in the nano or even sub nano range. And then agglomeration processes or aggregation processes have to happen for these um, nucleated droplets or particles to grow to the next size. And then other phenomena have to come into play to produce more particles in a larger size. So if you look at particles that are you know in, in the uh, atmosphere around you, you see a log normal distribution typically. Um, log normal distributions also occur because of what we call multiplicative and divisive processes. Unlike a normal distribution which happens as I mentioned because you start with a mono size particles and then you keep adding particles to it or subtracting particles to it through various mechanisms and that is what causes the broadening of the, of the spectrum to happen. But in the case of a log normal distribution, the processes that are involved tend to be very different. Um, is nucleation a multiplicative process? What happens in nucleation? You take a liquid 
or a fluid of a finite volume, it gets finely divided into many, many discrete entities. And these are what constitute the nuclei that form. So it is a divisive process. You are taking um, a macroscopic amount of material and you are subdividing it into many, many microscopic constituents. So that is a divisive process. When you talk about multiplicative process, what do we mean? It is the other side. You, you start with a large particle and through various mechanisms of attrition, abrasion, erosion, you start forming finer particles from the large particle that is present. So a single particle can give rise to 10 particles or 100 particles or 1000 particles, right? So that is a multiplicative process. So log normal distribution typically results because you have these divisive and multiplicative processes going on, whereas a normal distribution happens because of additive and subtractive processes. And then the third kind of uh, size distribution is the power law distribution where if you plot logarithm of size to log versus logarithm of count, you get a straight line. Um, when does this happen? A power law distribution happens when there is a specific filtration process that is happening um, which excludes particles of a certain size and only allows through particles typically of smaller size. So it is almost like a truncation or curtailing of the particle size distribution um, which prevents it from having a normal tail in the distribution so to speak. So these are the, the three types of particle size distributions and if you look at mechanical operations in general, as I mentioned they would either fall into the second or the third category. So the distributions that you would see would either follow the log normal distribution or the log log or power law distribution. Um, and there are ways in which you can um, use these relationships to set specifications for processes and for facilities as well. So if you look at the three size distributions that I just mentioned, so one basically looks like this through this uh, some normal and you know there is a sigma. So this would be a typical normal distribution. A log normal distribution is typically plotted as cumulative counts of um, logarithm of cumulative count versus log squared of size. Um, so th these would be straight lines with a down slope, right? And finally you have the uh, log log of power law distribution. Where if you plot logarithm of count to logarithm of size, again you get a straight line. In general as particle size increases, counts will decrease. That is how nature operates. So for every particle that you can see, there are hundreds and millions of particles that you cannot see. For example, this room, you may see a few dust specks if you look very close, but remember that for every speck of dust you can see, there are literally millions of particles that are finer than that that you are not able to see with your naked eye. But if you had some good visualization or scanning equipment, you could see. I mean this room is just loaded with particles even though we do not really see them. Um, and so they all show this characteristic uh, downward slope. It is only that the, uh, the relationship between size and count is different. And by the way, each of these is uh, referred to as a, a level and this is referred to as a class and this is based upon the slope and the intercept. So for example, you can take 0.5 microns as your reference size and the count corresponding to the 0.5 microns, um, let us say that is accumulating on a surface per square centimeter, uh, let us say that this is 1000. So 1000 is the number of particles um, that are um, 
larger than half a micron per square centimeter of the surface. This would be called a level 1000 line. So supposing the, um, the count for another surface is 100, then this would be called a level 100 surface. So the uh, cleanliness of a sur surface can basically be ranked in terms of these levels. Similarly, if you want to know how clean this room is, you measure that in terms of class. So here, if you take 0.5 micron again on this axis, and let's say that this corresponds to 10,000 particles per cubic foot of air, this would be a class 10,000 room. Whereas if the same count was 100, this would be called a class 100 clean room. Okay. So traditionally, the class of a clean room is reference based on number of particles per cubic foot larger than half a micron. Now, a lot of these definitions have now gone metric. There's a new ISO classification of clean rooms and surfaces, but traditionally, people still like to use you know, these units. So when people talk about clean room manufacturing, you will typically hear them say class 100, class 1000, class 10,000, rather than you know, some mill standard so and so or ISO standard so and so. Okay? So these are terms that are good to be familiar with. Um, and, and again, in terms of mechanical operations, the relevance for this is that it involves filtration, which is a mechanical operation that we will study in, in more detail. The way that you maintain the, the particulate levels inside a, a facility like this is by providing appropriate filtration, controlling the filter efficiencies, and making sure that all the incoming air is directed through those filters so that you achieve a certain cleanliness level, whether it's a class 100 or a class 10,000 or a class 1. By the way, you know about silicon wafers that go into all of our microelectronics. Today, the industry standard is to make them in class 1 rooms. A class 1 room then basically means that there cannot be more than one particle that's 0.5 micron or larger per cubic foot of air inside that facility. So extremely clean um, manufacturing conditions. But it's interesting that even though the industry itself is cutting edge technology, you know, whether you're talking about microelectronics or integrated circuits, the way that you're achieving the, uh, the cleanliness that's required to do the manufacturing is by using some very basic mechanical operations such as filtration of the air, any process fluid that you use, again, <laughs> has to be filtered so that it's, it's kept clean. So, you know, mechanical operations um, is something that typically you don't think of as, as being cutting edge technology, but you really cannot do cutting edge technology without in some way involving what we conventionally define as, um, as mechanical operations. Um, so let's, let's complete our discussion of particle size distribution. The couple of other things that we need to keep in mind, all of our discussion so far, particularly with respect to scattering techniques, we have assumed that the suspensions are very dilute. Whereas in reality, many suspensions may be concentrated. Light scattering based techniques cannot be used when you have a concentrated solution because of what are called coincidence errors. If two particles are too close together, then the scattering um, from the two interferes with each other, and this introduces errors in your analysis. So the, typically, if you have a concentrated solution, first you have to dilute it down by adding some pure liquid until the concentration is reduced to a level that's low enough that you can use scattering-based techniques. But cannot always be done, and this can introduce errors also because you're Diluting fluid may not be that clean. So you do need methods that can also measure concentrated suspensions. Of course, filtration and microscopic analysis is always an option, but as we have discussed before, it's kind of a brute force technique and it's really not suited for quantitative analysis. So the other method that people have come up with, which is the alternative to light scattering, is using acoustic fields. Um, so this method called acoustic attenuation spectroscopy is one that is widely used to characterize particle size distribution in concentrated suspensions. And just like light scattering based methods work uh, on the principle of scattering from individual particles, 
Acoustic attenuation techniques also work on the, on the basis of the interaction of an acoustic field with particles that are in suspension. Um, it has advantages in the sense that the concentration of the sample uh, does not have a negative influence on the, on the results. But on the other hand, the limitation of the technique is if your sample is too dilute, it does not work. So the particle concentration level has to be above a certain value for acoustic attenuation spectroscopy techniques to use. And also as I have explained more in more detail in my lecture on NPTEL, you really need to scan the acoustic field at multiple frequencies in order to get a clear definition of the size distribution that is present. Um, otherwise for the same acoustic attenuation value, several particle sizes may be considered possible. And so, but if you use um, essentially a spectroscopic technique where you cycle the ultrasonic um, or the acoustic frequency through multiple values, you can obtain a unique size distribution. So this is a method that is currently used widely, particularly in industries like, for example, if you are trying to polish a surface, you require a, a slurry to do that. You know, slurry based micro polishing is widely used in many industries. In polishing using a slurry, clearly you need a high concentration of the slurry to make the process effective. But you also want to characterize the distribution of particle sizes in the slurry and relate them to surface polishing rate and so on. For that, acoustic attenuation spectroscopy is considered the most um, desirable method. In fact, we have one in our lab. Uh, if, if any of you want to take a look at it, it is in the second floor of the um, chemical engineering laboratory building. Um, the other aspect of particle size distribution that uh, uh, we should be aware of is nanoparticles. Um, nanoparticles present certain challenges. The, the, there are three that are really difficult to deal with. The first is that the scattering intensity drops as dp to the power 6. So when you go from micron size to nano size, the light scattering intensity can drop by 10 to the power 9. And so uh, scattering based techniques cannot be relied upon when you are when trying to measure size distributions of nanoparticles. The second difficulty is nanoparticles are very mobile. Um, they tend to diffuse at very high rates. So it is very hard to keep them in place and analyze them. They just keep moving around. The third problem is that they tend to agglomerate quite easily. So a nanoparticle will stay in suspension only for a limited period of time. There is a natural tendency for nanoparticles to find each other, stick to each other and form larger agglomerates. So these are the three major challenges in measuring size distributions of nanoparticles um, which are of course increasingly emerging as a focus for chemical process industries. So how do you address this? The first thing is three different sizes have been defined for nanoparticles. There is something called the primary particle size, there is something called the aggregate size and there is something called the crystal size. Um, the reason we do this is you know if you look at, if you look at a particle um, in the nano size range, it is very very rare to find these particles existing in isolation. You know initially you may start with a distribution like this but quickly you start forming these agglomerates right. So when you say size or you clearly there are two sizes you can think of. The size of the individual particle before it agglomerates is what we would term a primary size. And then once it agglomerates and forms a stable agglomerate, we would call the size of that agglomerate the agglomerate size. But in addition there is a third size that we need to be aware of because many nano materials in particular have crystalline structures. The crystal size is another important parametric because the crystal size may decide the functional properties of that nanoparticle. So in terms of the magnitudes, crystal size is the smallest, <coughs> primary size is the next larger and then the aggregate size is the largest. So you need to have size measurement methods that can measure these different sizes separately. So crystal size is typically measured using an instrument called XRD, X-ray diffraction analyzer which uses Bragg's law to measure the degree of crystallinity of your sample as well as the size of the crystal itself. So XRD is the primary technique for measurement 
for determining the crystal size. For determining the primary particle size which is the individual nanoparticle a technique that seems to work well is called DLS or dynamic light scattering. So again the crystal size you measure using XRD, the primary particle size you measure using DLS it is also called photocorrelation spectroscopy, DLS stands for dynamic light scattering. So the way this works instead of trying to fight the fact that nanoparticles move around quickly the method actually takes advantage of the fact that nanoparticles move around quickly. So in dynamic light scattering you take an image of a particle at one position and then you kind of look at it again um, some finite time down the road and see how far the particle has moved because that can then be correlated to the diffusivity of the particle which of course depends on the size of the particle. So dynamic light scattering device actually measures the displacement of nanoparticles as a function of time and uses that to extract information about the size of the particle of course the basic assumption would be spherical particle. But uh, given that assumption it is a reasonably accurate method in determining um, the size, dis size distribution of primary particles in the nano range. Agglomerate size on the other hand you are really looking at the less mobile um, fixed in place agglomerates of particles because once nanoparticles start agglomerating they lose their mobility. So a static light scattering technique would work fine. So you know the light scattering methods that we have discussed earlier will work well to describe the size distribution of, of um, nanoparticle agglomerates once they have formed in your suspension. So the, the point is that you know nanoparticles have to be always treated a little differently from particles in a, in a larger size range. We will come back and discuss this again in, in more detail um, in terms of how nanoparticles are synthesized, how nanoparticles are stored, how nanoparticles are transported, how they are kept dispersed in solutions. These are all important things to, to learn as part of the mechanical operations course because increasingly mechanical operations are being used to produce nanoparticles. So there is a very clear link between the two that uh, we will um, deal with later on in the course. All right, so let us uh, move from the shape and size analysis to the next thing that we need to know about basic properties of particles which is of relevance to multiple mechanical operations and that is the, um, the interfacial behavior of particles. Um, again when, when, you, when you produce particles you are not producing them in isolation you will have a population that you are creating through your mechanical operation. It is very important to understand how these particles interact with each other, what are the major forces that they exert on each other and how does that affect the behavior of this particle population. Now when you look at an individual particle it actually has a structure that is well defined and you can kind of classify this structure into three regions. So if you have a particle the outermost contour of the particle is called its surface and the innermost nucleus of this particle is called the core and the region in between is called the subsurface. So clearly the, um, the surface is the one that is most exposed to the environment that the particle finds itself in and the core is the least exposed. For example let us say that you have an aluminum particle and it is exposed to let us say an oxidizing environment okay. The core of this particle will still represent aluminum in all its properties. The structure will be like aluminum all of its uh, mechanical, electrical all the properties will also be that of pure aluminum. However if you look at the surface itself it will be a mix of Al and Al2OX properties because the surface would have got oxidized. So the surface of this aluminum particle 
would have properties that are not only representative of aluminum but also of the various oxides of aluminum. And then what is going to happen in the region in between? Are we going to see the core properties persist till here and then there is a sudden change to surface properties at the surface? No, that is not how it happens. In fact, the subsurface region provides a gradient for all the properties. So, it will be a gradual change in the properties of the particle from its core value at the center of the particle to its surface value on, on its outer periphery which reflects the circumstances that the particle finds itself in. So, there will be many kinds of gradients, there will be concentration gradients, there will be defect gradients, uh, there will be uh, grain structure gradients. All these gradients will happen in the intervening space between the core of the particle and the surface of the particle. Now, if you are trying to figure out how a particle will interact with another neighboring particle and with the medium that it is present in, which region of the particle is the most relevant? It is clearly the surface, right? The surface is what the particle presents to its immediate environment. So, in order to understand interfacial behavior between the particle and the medium that it is suspended in as well as its nearest neighbor other particles, you have to characterize the surface quite thoroughly. And in terms of the interaction between uh, neighboring particles and the interaction between the surrounding fluid and the immersed particle, there are three forces or phenomena that are the most relevant that we need to be aware of. The first, uh, first is surface energy of the particle. The second is um, inter, intermolecular or interparticle forces. These are the Van der Waals forces. And the third is adsorption. Now clearly adsorption is of particular importance when you have solid particles that are suspended in gases. Um, of course the equivalent of that is absorption where, where you have a particle that is um, immersed in a, in a liquid medium. Um, of the three, clearly surface energy is a reflection of the surface of the particle. Um, interparticle forces are also surface forces. However, adsorption slash absorption can involve not only the surface but also the subsurface and if chemisorption is involved, it can even in, in, incorporate the core of the particle, right? Because when, when you adsorb something or absorb something, it does not just stop at the surface. It then diffuses to the subsurface, eventually to the core. So of the three, adsorption slash absorption involves virtually the entire particle whereas surface energy and interparticle forces are mostly reflective of the, of the surface itself. So what is surface energy? The closest equivalent is surface tension of a liquid. Surface energy is a reflection of the readiness of the particle to react with its environment. The higher the surface energy of a particle, the more reactive it is with the surrounding fluid as well as with adjacent particles. Uh, a way to also think about surface energy is, it is the energy that is left once the surface has been created. So when, when you try to create a surface, it involves energy. But not all the energy is used up in creating the surface. So the excess energy that is left over when the surface is created is called surface energy. The more the excess energy that is left over, the more ready the particle is to interact with whoever comes near it, right? Whether it is fluid molecules or whether it is um, its adjacent particles. So surface energy is a crucial parameter and um, because it really determines how ready the particle is to react or interact with its nearest neighbors. So the definition of the um, surface energy is, is also important and there is a thermodynamic definition of it which um, uh, goes as follows. 
So let us say that gamma is the surface energy parameter and let us say that Ea is the surface area that is created okay. So then gamma times dA can be related to dE minus tds plus summation mu i dNi where dE refers to the surface excess of internal energy, dS represents the surface excess of entropy, mu i is the chemical potential of the ith species and dNi represents the surface excess of atoms of species i. Okay. Um, now uh, F equals E minus TS right that is a Helmholtz free energy. So, so if you substitute that in this you can rewrite this as DF plus SDT um, uh, sorry this should be a minus sign minus summation over I mu I dNi. So from this you can define you can derive a, a definition for surface energy as del A um, actually del F over del A at constant temperature constant um, Ni and constant volume of the system also. So this is the classical definition of surface energy it is the rate of change of Helmholtz free energy with created area keeping temperature constant, keeping Ni constant and keeping the total volume of the system constant. Now this is a thermodynamic definition of gamma. However experimentally it is very difficult to estimate gamma using this equation. So experimentally the way that surface energy is measured is similar to the way surface tension of liquids is measured. How do you measure surface tension of liquids? Any idea? Has anybody done surface tension measurements? What do you what do you measure typically when you are trying to measure surface tension of a liquid? What is the one parameter that is that is affected most sensitively by surface tension? Contact angle right. So in order to measure surface tension you would basically take a surface deposit a drop of the liquid on it and you will find you know what angle it makes. Um, so if you get a high angle of contact what does that mean? It has low surface tension right. Uh, it is not wetting the surface very well, wettability is very poor, the liquid tends to bead up on the surface, it is not spreading on the surface. So the contact angle is very high um, whereas if it is a, if it is a, um, a liquid that wets the surface very well then it will form um, a film like this and the contact angle will be very low. So what does that mean? It is basically high surface tension right. So typically the way that you would measure surface energy of a particle is very similar except that in this case what how, how are you doing this? When you use this method contact angle measurement or goniometry as it is called to measure the surface tension of a liquid you assume that you know the surface tension of the solid and you are measuring the surface tension of the liquid relative to that. When you are trying to measure the surface tension or surface energy of a solid the process is reversed. You take a liquid of known surface tension actually you take three liquids of known surface tension deposit it on the solid whose surface energy you are trying to calculate and find the, um, the, the contact angle that it makes in every case and you can use that data to then extract the surface energy of the solid because you know the surface tension of the liquid you can use this data to obtain the surface energy of the solid. So you can use the same technique it is just that the way you use it is slightly different in the two cases. So one way to measure surface energy is by measuring the contact angle of known liquids on that particular material and from that extracting the surface energy information. Um, another way to look to calculate surface energy 
is by looking at its, its, its effects. You know, one of the effects of surface energy is in promoting adhesion. So you can, if, if there is a particle whose surface energy you do not know and you are trying to measure, you can bring it near a surface and look at the force of adhesion that it develops. The higher the force of adhesion, the higher the surface energy of the solid. And how do you measure this force of adhesion? One technique is using an atomic force microscope or AFM. And AFM is a very, very sensitive technique to look at molecular level forces of adhesion between two surfaces. So you can actually use an AFM to measure the force that develops between the particle and a surface that it is being brought close to. And you can use that as an indirect estimate of the surface energy of the particle. And similarly, if you have particles in a, in a flowing suspension, you can measure the cohesive force between the particles and use that as an indirect measure of the surface energy of the particle. So in general, if you have an application where you want highly adhesive, highly reactive, highly cohesive behavior, you want to synthesize particles that have high surface energy. On the other hand, if you want to have a system where you know, there is very little cohesion, there is very little adhesion and you want the particles to kind of be independent of each other, then you want to make particles that are of low surface energy. You know, in terms of materials, classic example would be Teflon. Teflon is a low surface energy material, right? It, it, it's, it repels everything. It is very difficult to get things to stick to Teflon. On the other hand, um, metals such as stainless steel, nickel have extremely high surface energy. So anything that comes close to these surfaces will get held on to very firmly by these surfaces. So uh, typically metals and alloys are high surface energy materials. Uh, polymers, plastics, elastomers are low surface energy materials. So you can actually tailor the material to your liking. And there are ways for a given material to increase its surface energy and to decrease its surface energy as well. For example, if you have the surface and you want to reduce its surface energy, how would you do it? One way to reduce surface energy is to actually coat it with a material that has low surface energy. For example, you could just coat this with some kind of a polymer film that has a low surface energy and that will make it much more cleanable. In fact, that is one reason why um, these um, adhesive films are typically put on uh, metal surfaces in order to make it more cleanable. You might have seen even in <coughs> household furniture, they put these protective coatings right on sofas, on tables, spray on coatings. And the reason they do that is to make it more cleanable. Um, typically household furniture materials have high surface energy, not easy to clean, but if you can put these um, low surface energy polymeric coatings on them, like scotch card is a classic example, all of a sudden it becomes very low surface energy surface and it's, you can easily wipe things off. So you know surface energy, you know, even though it is a very fundamental thermodynamic parameter, has a lot of very, very practical applications and, and implications that you should be aware of. Um, there is another parameter that is used to measure um, particularly the Van der Waals adhesion forces called the Hamaker constant. Have you heard of the Hamaker constant at all? The Hamaker constant is one that again is um, reasonably easy to measure experimentally um, and it is related to the surface energy. In general, the higher the surface energy, the higher the Hamaker constant of a surface. We will discuss in one of the later classes what influence the Hamaker constant has in how a system of two particles with an intervening fluid medium behaves, but it is important to realize that there is a very clear and solid link between the Hamaker constant and the surface energy. All right, so we have talked about the first interfacial parameter that is of importance which is surface energy. Um, particularly with respect to nano suspensions, um, as I have mentioned before, agglomeration of the nanoparticles is a serious problem that process industry faces. It is it's relatively easy to make nanoparticles, but to keep them in the nano dimension is very hard. So a technique that is used is, is to add dispersants, you know, surfactants, which actually provide a coating on these nanoparticles. 
and the way it works is again on the basis of surface energy. You can reduce the surface energy of a nanoparticle by coating it with a surfactant material that has a lower surface energy. So now the particles are will tend to repel each other or at least not attract each other to the same extent and that is the reason why nanoparticle suspensions are frequently stabilized by using um, surfactants as dispersants. The surfactants are nothing but coating materials that provide a low surface energy exterior to the nanoparticles and greatly slow down the agglomeration process. Now the second aspect is the interparticular forces between particles. Um, so this is again important to understand particularly the, the Leonard Jones potential which, which uh, dictates how particles in a suspension behave. So we will start with that discussion in, in the next class and, and go on. Um, any questions on what we have covered today or so far in the material? Okay, so I will see you tomorrow.